Good afternoon, my name is Doug Midori. I'm the Director of Internet Analysis at Kentic, and today I'm gonna to give a talk about the B2B hijacks targeting cryptocurrency services and a little about routing security in general. So I wrote up uh, an analysis of uh, the B2B hijacks involved in the Seller Bridge uh, cryptocurrency attack last year, and I'm gonna talk a little about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little about some of the prior cryptocurrency hijacks uh, that took place uh, in a uh, somewhat similar manner and have a little discussion about what can be done to prevent these attacks and what can be learned uh, more broadly about how they reveal weaknesses in our internet infrastructure um, and um, talk about some of those routing security mechanisms. So why don't we start with the seller bridge uh, attack. So this occurred in August 2022. And Seller Bridge, I hadn't heard of it prior to this attack. I don't know. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time with uh, cryptocurrencies, but this is a, a service that allows users to convert uh, currencies between different cur uh, cryptocurrency uh, types, among other things. Um, and an attacker, a fairly sophisticated attacker, uh, used a BGB hijack to gain control of a portion of the IP address uh, space originated by AWS. Uh, so they went after a pretty big uh, target and hijacking AWS address space. So that address space was hosting some of the seller bridge infrastructure uh, and that allowed them to impersonate it with uh, some copycat code uh, that inserted these malicious smart contracts. So these would then uh, uh, cause the, uh, the cryptocurrency service to, um, uh, when conditions were met, uh, redirect uh, digital assets to another wallet. In this case, they were able to, uh, when people logged in um, and were uh, uh, loaded this page, uh, linked up with their wallets, their uh, digital assets were were stolen. And then uh, from there, they were laundered through a few other, other exchanges uh, to try to hide the attacks, uh, hide the track, the tracks of the attacker. Um, so there's a lot of parts to this that involve cryptocurrency infrastructure, but what I was interested in is uh, how the B2B hijack was so successful. So to make it successful, the user had to do, uh, the attackers had to do a couple of things. These were fairly sophisticated people who were familiar with the weaknesses of our system. And so it's important that we study what are those weaknesses. The first of which was um, understanding how transit providers build their filter lists uh, automatically uh, based on uh, IRR uh, data. And so one of the, um, uh, one of the weak points, it turns out, is in a service called AltDB. If it's a free alternative to some of the other um, uh, routing object uh, services out there, and um, uh, it doesn't have a lot of um, it doesn't have a lot of uh, security around it or overhead. This is a free service, um, and so the attackers figured out that they could add an entry uh, into AltDB, and then uh, transit providers around the world would automatically suck that up and add a uh, uh, allow for um, whatever entry you put in there. In this case, they're adding this small uh, or extending the entry for QuickHost, which is a small hosting provider in the UK, and saying that they should be allowed to announce an Amazon uh, address space to its transit providers, which would be, I think, pretty surprising to someone at AWS or uh, someone familiar with internet infrastructure. Generally, AWS does not need a help from a small hosting provider to announce address space. Regardless, they were able to get these entries into AltDB, and the tra transit providers were able to were, uh, pick them up as expected and added them to their whitelist, so they would uh, send the um, allow these routes to pass. Uh, the other thing that had to take place was that the attacker altered the AS path of their routes uh, to um, forge an origin of uh, AWS uh, in the AS path. So in this case, the AS path was uh, 1299, uh, which is Aurelion, 209-243, uh, which is QuickHost, and then 14618, which is one of the Amazon um, uh, ASs used uh, by AWS. Uh, Having done so, then when Aurelion, which drops and ballads, uh, would see this route, uh, it would be evaluated as 
valid. This is an RPI valid route. The origin matches the address space, and therefore it would allow this route to, to um, circulate. And then the graphic here is just, uh, one of our BGB visualizations uh, from Chemtech. And the light green uh, on the timeline is showing, you know, how far these malicious routes, the malicious route uh, propagated. It basically was uh, globally propagated for uh, multiple periods of time uh, and a three hour uh, window. Uh, it eventually went away over an hour later than Amazon uh, um, had finally figured out what had taken place. And they started announcing the, sla the same sl slash 24. Uh, hoping that they would be able to um, regain control of the address space, <clears throat> which they did, although the attack was already uh, had already taken place at that point. So there was an alteration of the AS path to trick RPKI ROV, as well as uh, a bogus entry added into AltDB. So as you mentioned, <clears throat> Amazon didn't announce the slash uh, 24 until uh, la the last hijack was uh, finished, and there were multiple um, uh, cryptocurrency uh, thefts that took place during this time window, according to Coinbase, who was uh, another cryptocurrency company with a very, uh, very smart threat intel team that really dissected this, wrote up, wrote up a great uh, um, technical uh, brief about the, uh, the, the attack. Uh, it's important to note that Coinbase was not the target of this. Uh, I think that's important to mention. Uh, they just did a good job of writing up what took place. I, if you want more information, you should take a look at their write-up. Uh, but like I said, this wasn't the first time cryptocurrencies were targeted. You know, cryptocurrencies are um, uh, a favorite target of uh, attackers, of hackers, because uh, they're, you, know, you can instantaneously gain uh, uh, currency gain money and there's no way to back it out once it's done um and uh and you can um there's ways you can try to hide your tracks so this is, all can be done computationally and um uh, in a way that you just can't do if you're trying to steal it from a from a bank having said that uh in april to, uh, 2018 we saw you may recall uh amazon's authoritative dns service uh, formerly known as route 53 had been hijacked um uh, and what we had, um, there may be other things that were targeted, but the thing that everybody noticed was um, the uh, the DNS entry for my Ether wallet, which was a cryptocurrency wallet service, um, had been hijacked. And um, uh, yeah, so the the Route 53 was was um, hijacked. It would return a bogus entry of the wrong IP address when someone looked up uh, the um, uh, that domain. We give an IP address that was in Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, to be precise, and then at that at that IP address was a, an imposter website that looked identical, uh, behaved identical, and as soon as you logged in, uh, you had to click through a certificate error, which was very very disappointing for a lot of people in the security space. Um, most people, most users did that; they clicked through the the error um, that was highlighting them that there, there's possibly a security problem. They logged in anyway, and once they did, they had their wallet uh, emptied and their, their funds stolen. Uh, so uh, this was maybe one of the first ones. Uh, there's been, I think, several that haven't made the, haven't been made the public sphere, but, um, but this was maybe the first one that we saw that got uh, analyzed. Uh, there was another uh, attack in February 2022, so last year, uh, where attackers uh, went after the users of ClaySwap, which is a cryptocurrency exchange in South Korea, by performing a BGB hijack of IP address space of a South Korean hosting provider that was hosting a library that would get loaded. So the website that users were going to, uh, the web service that they're going to, was fine. It wasn't getting, it wasn't the target. But when, as you as you as you may know, uh, when you load a website, that website is then fetching things from other uh, sites. So it's you're never just loading stuff from one place, or quite rarely. In this case, the attackers, again, were fairly sophisticated, determined that, that there was a, a weakness in the setup and were able to hijack uh, this South Korean hosting provider, Kakao, uh, and then load in a, uh, during the hijack, load in a, uh, uh, a, a bogus version, a modified version of the JavaScript library that would allow them to then take over control of the, um, uh, uh, the people's currencies and 
seal them. And so uh, this was a bit more of a um, uh, kind of a supply chain um, uh, attack where you're loading, you're intercepting the loading of a, of a library, which uh, means that not you can't. You need to secure not just your own website, but all the other uh, sites that you're pulling stuff from. Um, so that was another one that was successful, uh, fairly sophisticated. Um, and there's, uh, I wrote up some analysis, or actually the best write-up is um, out of the researchers from Princeton who went through and, uh, and uh, painstakingly looked at all the details of how this got was take, took place. It also reveals some weaknesses in our overall infrastructure. Um, yeah, so back to the Cellar Bridge incident, you know, I, I tried to um, think about like what could be the things that could have helped here, because uh, it's not, it, there were some, um, there was some evidence there that uh, in theory someone could have uh, figured out, um, uh, you know, that they, they could have been alerted of these um, uh, incidents when they happen. And so, you know, in my write-up, I looked at, you know, DNS monitoring. So uh, in those cases, um, if, uh, if, if uh, you have agents around the world uh, constantly making queries, if one of them doesn't match uh, the expected results, then we know that uh, some DNS has been compromised uh, somewhere, uh, and you'd have to react to that somehow. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, seeing this quick host AS, this AS209243 as an upstream, as like a transfer provider for Amazon, that ought to be uh, you know, flagged as an un unauthorized upstream, as usually what we, how we refer to it, um, and deemed suspicious, whether that could be automated or not is a question. It seems like there's evidence there that it could have been uh, caught. Um, but I think the more important thing is to address uh, RPROV. So in this case, Amazon had a ROA for that prefix. Uh, that was hijacked and it didn't help so why didn't it work so i think at this point it's worth uh putting all this in context and doing a quick detour very briefly on the state of routing security so you know when i started in this space back in 2009 uh um, we hadn't really gotten very far in routing security and i like to refer to this problem space as a constellation of problems that lie on this spectrum of difficulty. Uh, from one end, there's just bonehead errors, people making fat finger mistakes that cause disruptions. And those happen. And then on up to the other end of the spectrum of a determined adversary that's very technically sophisticated that is uh, going to try to defeat whatever security mechanisms you roll out. That is where the seller bridge thing uh, sits. It's on the, at that end of the spectrum. So, you know, it's only recently that we've been able to um, move the move the needle, so to speak, of like what it is that we can prevent from autom using automated uh, mechanisms. Um, and uh, so there's been a lot of progress that we should take a moment to um, congratulate ourselves on achieving. And so one of those is that, you know, for RPKI ROV, we have a lot of backbone providers now that uh, reject RPKI invalid routes. Um, we also have uh, a lot more routes with ROAs. So um, you need two things to for RPKI to, to do its thing. You need to be able to have a ROA that tells you what's the ground truth, and then a network that's uh, in, uh, rejecting invalid routes. And so the graph on the right is from NIST, the US agent, federal agency that studies uh, um, lots of technical things, but they have an office that does routing security. So the graphic from their website showing the, the trend lines, which are going in a, a very good direction of the number of valid routes versus routes without ROAs. Um, and this is actually from last year. This is, uh, the, the lines are getting closer. Uh, at some point in the next year, they'll cross and we'll have more routes that are valid than unknown. And on the left-hand side was analysis that I did with uh, our uh, aggregate NetFlow data, looking at just, you know, in bits per second, going the traffic getting sent out on the internet when we throw all of our customer data together, uh, how much is going to the different types of route uh, uh, routes evaluated and um, uh, based on their evaluation. And, uh, we see nowadays about 62% of routes uh, going to, uh, sorry, of traffic going to routes that are uh, valid. They have a valid ROA, or they would be evaluated as RPI valid. Uh, so a clear majority of the traffic uh, is eligible for protection, assuming someone's uh, dropping invalids. That's the, the other 
key part. And so to address that part of it, uh, we looked at, you know, when we look compare how far um, um, routes propagate uh, based on whether they're uh, RPA not found or unknown routes without AROA or valid, um, those two, in those two cases, they shouldn't be, um, shouldn't have any issues with their propagation. And then you compare that to RPI invalid routes, whether V4 or V6, uh, the, the propagation of invalid routes is dramatically less. And so this is the system doing its uh, job, uh, limiting uh, the propagation and therefore the potential disruption due to an origination leak or something uh, regarding uh, if, a, if a route gets uh, evaluated as invalid. So back to uh, Seller Bridge. So, so as I last mentioned, Amazon had a ROA for the pre this prefix. Why didn't RPKI RV help? Because it didn't, uh, is the bottom line. And so there's a couple of causes for this. One is the fact that Amazon, uh, in this address space, and this is common for some of the other address space that they announced, they have, in my opinion, very liberal ROAs. So they, uh, um, RPI will allow a wide range of scenarios to, uh, uh, of, of routes to um, be evaluated as uh, valid that come from the announced Amazon address space. So there's three different ASs that can announce, they're allowed to announce uh, the address space and the prefix size can be anywhere between a slash 10 all the way down to a slash 24. In this case, it was uh, the, the malicious route was a slash 24. Uh, that was a more specific of a slash, I think 11. Uh, uh, had the max prefix length been set differently, uh, then it would would have been evaluated as invalid and would have been blocked by Aurelion uh, from uh, propagating out on the internet. So it's worth noting that there, uh, since last summer, there was an RFC published, RFC 93, uh, 9319, uh, describing the use of max length in a resource, uh, you know, an RPKI, and specifically the the recommendation is leaving the max max length or max prefix length field blank in a ROA, because it has the same effect uh, as just matching whatever is the route that you're announcing. Um, that that would be the the max prefix length. So if you ma announce a slash twenty three. You don't need to uh, specify the max uh, length. It's an optional field. Uh, if you don't specify it, then anything more, uh, more specific than a slash 23 would be evaluated as invalid automatically. Um, if you change that slash 23 to a 22, then everything more specific than a 22 would be uh, automatically deemed invalid. So it's a it's a recommended use uh, that I think was little uh, little known until uh, this. Uh, um, RFC was published in the past year, worth considering. But even all this, uh, so I think that would have helped in this case, um, but it's important to know that um, uh, RPKI ROV is not really aimed at uh, eliminating the possibility of uh, the impersonation of ASs, which is what is, uh, is happening in this case. And to do that, you need to have something like BGP SEC, which is a not fielded uh, presently. This is a uh, a, a routing security technology we hope to have um, ready to go in the near future. Uh, that is what would be uh, how we would cryptographically try to prove uh, the identity of ASs. <clears throat> now, one of the main critiques against BGBSEC is that its protection only extends uh, via contiguous BGPSEC aware ASs. As soon as you cross an AS that doesn't isn't BGPSEC aware, then all the guarantees uh, provided by BGPSEC would be lost at that point. Um, and so uh, that limits how how far the protection can um, uh, can extend. Uh, that's that's a true true statement. But having said that, uh, I think the case of RPKI ROV uh, provides the lesson of the benefits of even just having major networks of the internet. Um, if if no one else besides the major networks uh, uh, field um, a security mechanism, there's a lot of benefit to be had. And so if major cloud providers and major network service providers alone were uh, fielding BGB sec so that between their links, you couldn't uh, uh, squeeze in a uh, an AS impersonation in a forged route, uh, then that would really limit um, the efficacy of these types of uh, attacks. And it would have uh, 
it would have prevented the Seller Bridge case and that Aurelion and Amazon would have already had a, a, a direct connection. Uh, another route that was, uh, and those those routes would be um, uh, verified by B2BSEC. If another route came through QuickHost, the small hosting provider in the UK, and was not, um, it was not uh, verified, then it would be not, um, uh, it would be deprioritized over the prioritized uh, secured routes uh, sent directly from a Amazon to Aurelion. So I, we would, I think a lot of us would argue that partial deployment does offer benefits um, uh, that uh, the critique aside. So, you know, looking at the uh, numbers around, especially RPKI, ROV, uh, I w wish there were a couple of facts that became more common knowledge in networking. And the number one is that the majority of internet traffic measured in bits per second is directed to RPKI valid routes. That's based on our uh, Kentix aggregate net flow, uh, which is a very large amount of uh, data of traffic records. Uh, we have a lot of traffic right now that is eligible for protection from RPKI ROV. And at number two, uh, route propagation is cut in half when evaluated as RPKI invalid. So there's a lot of efforts out there to measure precisely which ASs are dropping uh, invalids. And it is likely the case that uh, it is a small numeric number of uh, ASs that actually drop invalids. Um, having said that, we have some very important networks uh, that are uh, arguably more important than others. Uh, so not every, a every AS has the same impact on the rest of the internet. And when we have most of the internet's backbone providers dropping invalids, then uh, they end up um, offering a lot of protection to the rest of the internet, uh, which is a really good thing. And it's important to point out that there have been many engineers at many companies that have worked very hard to get us to this point. Uh, so this has been a success story, but there's a lot left to be done. Um, and it's important to know what is the vision for the uh, going uh, into the future. You may be hearing from a certain routing security evangelist sometime soon um, <clears throat> to hear about uh, the uh, you know, what what's what's the vision for the future but you know we've uh rolled out a lot of important routing security um, mechanisms uh in the recent years and they are doing a lot of good i i argue that there are, are less uh disruptive routing leaks as a result of some of this work so that's peer lock um rpk uh cleanup of irr i mentioned um, RPKI's, uh, uh, we discussed some of the stats around RPKI. Again, this is more focused on reducing accidental uh, typos, uh, origination leaks. Um, uh, but in the future, uh, if we can um, roll out BGBSEC to eliminate uh, origin uh, impersonation and an ASPA, which is a, uh, a mechanism I haven't mentioned yet, but this is something that allows ASs to uh, publicly enumerate what are the transit relationships that they have, and that would enable other networks to be able to pick out using the AS path what's a value free violation and reject those routes. Um, that ought to have a, um, a very positive impact on adjacency leaks, which really aren't covered in BGPSEC or, or RPKI. So that's the that's the vision, and it took us honestly many years to get to where we are now. But we're in a better place than we were again when I started back in 2009, and um, and it may take uh, a number of years before those uh, those other technologies are fielded in a way that improves our routing security. But uh, we have no other choice. Uh, routing uh, is not going away. The internet's not going away. Uh, this is what we have. It's a very difficult problem, and we have no choice but to continue trying to make uh, progress on this. So I hope uh, you'll help me on that. Um, uh, Taiwan is doing a terrific job of RPKI uh, ROV, or ROA creation. Um, it's one of the best in the world. Uh, so um, I look forward to your uh, participation in these other uh, technology rollouts. Uh, with that, um, I would happily take any of your questions. Thank you. I have a, a minor query regarding your slides. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned uh, peer luck, BGP sec, and the uh, ASPA. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate uh, further on the utilization of peer luck? Uh, if you be useful, if you could provide example for better understanding. Okay, 
I'll do my best. Um, okay, thank you. She asked for uh, peer lock, ASPA, and what was the third thing? Uh, BGP sec. BGP sec. Well, I'll BGP, do my best on that. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. So peer lock was just a mechanism uh, that came up uh, come up by. Um, Job Snyder's was proposed by him a few years ago, and this was just to get some of the, the top tier, like backbone tier one providers to add filters where they should never be learning a route from um, uh, uh, from another um, uh, another tier one. They should never uh, learn one from a customer. And there's like a couple of simple rules that you could enumerate and you could even automate the generation of these uh, these rules to the um, what type of routes you would accept. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of uh, documentation online on this uh, to you know, maybe explain it a little better than I'm doing right now. But um, uh, the idea is just you would take the, the big providers and then uh, make sure that they're not uh, passing uh, leaked routes uh, between them. And um, honestly, I think that's probably one of the biggest things in, in these uh, uh, big leaks that we've had in the past. This is something that um, really limits the um, uh, uh, the, the propagation of those leaks and the limits of disruption. Uh, let's see. So then uh, ASPA uh, is, as I mentioned, a mechanism where an AS would en enumerate its who its transit providers or transit customers were um, and uh, into a RPKI system. So RPKI is kind of the, the foundation and something like ROV is a is a kind of application that runs over the RPKI infrastructure. Uh, ASPA would also be uh, another uh, use case of the data that's stored in uh, the RPKI uh, infrastructure. And, and so with that, if you knew, um, if you received a, a route with an AS path, you could check the adjacencies in the AS path against uh, those um, stated transit links uh, that are in, um, uh, that would be saved by someone participating in ASPA and find um, essentially a, a valley free. So there's a concept in routing of, of uh, you don't want, um, AS paths should exhibit some kind of a, a hill, like you're climbing up transit links down and then to the top and then down the other side. That's the, uh, the idea and then um, if it's if it's a valley that means you're there's likely a, a routing leak going on there um, uh, where an AS goes down the transit link like down to a customer and then back up to a transit provider that means that customer is paying two sides for this, uh, two transit providers to move the traffic um, and um, anyway so that would enable people to find uh, problematic uh, AS path issues where everything else has been kind of origin based uh, and it's limited to that. And then um, lastly, you asked about BGB SEC. And so um, I'm not the best uh, source information on BGB SEC uh, as far as um, uh, some of the, the technical implementation things. I know there's concerns around, you know, can a router, this is a, this is a computational load that every message that was received would have to be uh, checked. Uh, there'd be a, a cryptographic signature to be checked. If there's a lot of messages coming in, that's, you're asking a, a router to do a lot more than it was doing in the past. So there's some concern over the computational load uh, that this would uh, put on a router. Um, and I think uh, the idea is that if we were to end up with some sort of a partial deployment, um, a router wouldn't be checking every one of its uh, uh, messages. It would just be tracking a portion of them. And um, but that alone would offer some some benefit. And then um, you know, the, the, the point I made in the talk where uh, this protection does not extend beyond uh, into any ASs that are not BGPSEC aware, um, uh, that's a that is a limitation of the technology, um, but uh, uh, I think just like RPKI ROV, uh, there's a lot of benefit, even if you just got the big players to have a secure mesh between them, uh, it would do a, add a lot of um, security to the, uh, the to the internet. Let's see, um, and there's a, you see there's a question in the chat, uh, more comprehensive details on implementation of BGBSEC ASPA, associated costs, considerations for hardware and software for support. Um, I'm not adequately in this uh, in this in this forum here, but um, uh, like I said, there's a there are concerns around hardware costs, specifically around BGP sec. Um, I think ASPA, I don't know, may and there's there's not a 
there's less of a cryptographic thing. There's more of a, um, you're just checking AS path against known things, a little bit like our ROV is working right now. You're just, you have a, a data set that you're checking, uh, checking the origins against. Um, that's uh, less computationally taxing than um, doing a, a cryptographic check. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, do you, uh, is there, there are any further questions? So, uh, may I have a, a last question? Do you have any idea or have any concept to us to encourage ISP to enable their ROV filter? Do you have any idea to encourage them? To encourage uh, ISPs to, to do which? To enable ROV. Oh, to, yeah, to like to, yeah. to reject RPK invalid yes, um, yeah. routes. Um, well, I guess, uh, the point I, I was, uh, making is part of the, one of the slides that I had, uh, that I worked on with Job, uh, Snyder's, uh, for last year, uh, was to look at, you know, when we look at our, our, all the traffic data that we have, uh, the aggregate net flow, uh, the fact that, um, uh, most traffic is getting sent to routes with ROAs and, um, uh, and then the routes, routes that are invalid, that, that ought to, that ought to incentivize someone to create, um, sorry, to, to drop invalids, uh, knowing that people are creating, uh, a lot of your traffic's going to ROAs. If you drop an invalid, uh, that means you're protecting you, how you egress traffic. You're going to not believe a leaked route or some sort of problematic route. Uh, so there's the fact that there's a lot of traffic going to routes with ROAs that ought to be in, uh, uh, self-evident uh, motivation to be drop, rejecting invalids. And then the flip side is, um, given that there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, that we are measuring how the impact of, on propagation of invalids, that ought to be more incentive, incentive uh, a greater incentive to create ROAs, which is of the two, probably the easier uh, thing to do, but there's still people who haven't uh, created the ROAs, but, um, I think uh, it 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 you benefit uh, at this point because there's so much so many ROAs out there uh, that you uh, your your network would benefit by rejecting invalids um, because you're probably going to be protecting a large portion, if not the majority, of the traffic that you're egressing by doing so.